This is the Norris Group's Real Estate Investor Radio Show, the award-winning show dedicated to thought leaders shaping the real estate industry and local experts revealing their insider tips to succeed in an ever-changing real estate market. Hosted by author, investor, and hard money lender, Bruce Norris. Hi, thanks for joining us. My name is Bruce Norris, and once again today, we speak with Tony Alvarez. A lot of what you've bought has come through sources of realtors when they are REOs, but you've also bought properties directly from people. And I remember a story that you told me where you had gone to a house with a realtor, it didn't turn out to that would work out, but you noticed that there was tall grass in the house next door. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I want you to yeah. tell that story. So you knocked on the door and uh, you had to knock on it a few times before somebody finally came to the door. Yeah, I, I actually went to that place with my mother. I never forget that. I, my mom was riding with me in the car. And um, and I did. I went to see this one. It was in Burbank. And I went to see this house. And it was referred to me, actually, by a friend that I had at, at one of the banks that I had actually, at that time, uh, had done some work for as an appraiser uh, before. And uh, they said, hey, we got this REO that's up there. And, and, but when I went to see it, it had a pool. And I didn't really want, I really wasn't into that, you know, and, and uh, it, it was a little bit higher price than what I was wanting to pay. And they weren't ready to negotiate and stuff, but you're right. The house to the right of it was a really pretty house. I always liked trying to buy things that had a little bit different appeal or something in, in Burbank. You had a lot of really cutesy little houses built in the 1930s and twenties. And, and, uh, and this house was just, it was a pit though. The front was overgrown. And I noticed there was a bunch of boxes I, I used to work at a job that we had to go to the fruit market, and, you know, down in LA fruit, you know, vegetable and stuff like that. And there was a bunch of boxes from that, you know, and they were kind of full of flies and all this kind of stuff. It was horrific. Okay. But here's the interesting part to the right of that is a clover lawn. Yeah. I don't know if you, if people know what the clover lawn is, it's like clover, like, you know, mm -hmm. you know four leaves and three, whatever, whatever that could and it was in that part of the lawn was, perfect not a weed nothing on it which it didn't uh, make sense okay all yeah. the windows were covered up with black plastic it was just really didn't look good and so i tell my mom i said wait a second i'm gonna go knock is it okay if i just oh yeah go do your thing i go and i knock on the door and i'm knocking and knocking and, and everything is filthy it's just really nasty and all of a sudden the door opens and i and at the same time that the door opens and i see this guy's got a long beard long gray beard I get a whiff of the smell from this house, okay, from the inside of this house. It was putrid. It was, I can't even begin to explain it to you, enough to make me stand back a little bit. And, and he's, he looks filthy. He pretty much looks like a homeless guy. And he takes his hand and he says, and he rubs, starts rubbing his beard and his nails are literally inches, inches long, you know, several inches long and they're filthy. And he says, what do you want? And I said, well, you know, I, I, I don't know what to say to him, but I said, you know, I came to look at the house. I figured the truth is the only thing that could come to my brain, right? I said, I came to see the house next door. It's got a pool. I wanted to buy it. And, you know, and, and I, I do fixer uppers and stuff, but it's not, it's not going to work out and stuff. And I happen to see, and as I'm talking, I turn and there's the fruit boxes. I said, I happen to see you have some boxes out here. I thought maybe you were moving. <laughs> right. And he said, moving huh and he kind of smirks at me and i said yes sir i i just wanted to know if you're interested in selling your house and he goes well come on in and he mm -hmm. leaves the door open and he turns around and walks away from me and i said immediately i thought okay i, I was afraid to go in the, in the house i think this guy's going to be like a mass murderer or something right so i said excuse me my mother's in the car I wanted him to know <laughs> somebody <laughs> here knows I'm coming in your house, pal. You know, if you're going to do something, you're, go you're going to jail, you know? And, uh, and he stops and he goes, that's okay. That's all right. And I said, well, she'll wait in the car, you know, he says, come on in. And he just walks in and I go in and this place was, was, it, it looked like, and then I have had this experience before in different properties that we bought, like, like that, where, you know, somebody breaks in and is leaving in a vacant house and they're homeless and, you know, they got the shopping cart and they bring all their stuff back every night, you know, that they pick up on bottles and whatever. And it's their treasure. Right. So this house was 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 like that. And everything was dirty, filthy, smelly. And he walks into the kitchen. On top of that, he's cooking. 
a couple of pieces of chicken in this old dust frying pan, cast iron frying pan, and he's got yellow curry in there. And this smells throughout the whole house. And he looks up at me and I walk into the kitchen and he goes, <laughs> would you like something to eat? <laughs> now I will eat just about anything, okay? But I was like, oh no, thanks. Then he comes into the living room. He says, sit down. And I got to sit in this chair, right? And I got to pretend like I'm okay. And I, I sit in the chair and he says, would you like something to drink? And he offers me this filthy glass and he pours some cheap wine into it. And I said, no, 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 I, I can't drink. I, you know, I'm driving. And I, I was never going to, I'm not putting that into my mouth. I was worried enough sitting in the chair. Well, this man goes on to tell me his story. He wants to sell the house. He was a vet himself in the past. He used to own an escrow company. He was well off. <clears throat> Unfortunately, he had an accident. He had something fell and crushed his leg. He went into a coma. When he wakes up from the coma, he's lost his business. His wife has left with his best friend and his son is on drugs. And so his life spins completely out of control. And all he's got is this house. And he gets his check from either disability or whatever it is. And he was also a vet, so that, you know. And he would go down into Koreatown. And he confides in me that, you know, that's where the boxes of fruit come from, because he gets fruit and stuff at the LA market. But that he would hang out in these unsavory places with, you know, ladies of the night and all of this stuff. You know, he's, and he's telling me all these stuff. And I was like, OK, you know, but he ends up wanting to sell me the house. And he, and he tells me, I said, what do you want? And it was like ninety five thousand or something, you know, but he wanted it structured in a certain way. He wanted um, he wanted to carry the note. And, and by the way, he wanted to sell the house for a long time but he never wanted to list it with a broker because he was so embarrassed. He was aware of his condition, but right. he was embarrassed having somebody walk through and see him the way it is in his house. And uh, he said, that's why I cover up all the, all the, all the windows with this plot, with this black plastic. I don't want them to see. The part that I really want to get to is I recall you going and saying to him, okay, this isn't how you're going to end. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It took me, I left the house and I was kind of in shock and, and, Quite frankly, because you know, okay, <clears throat> we go into this business, it's all about the money and buying houses and all, all that kind of stuff. If you're in this business any length of time at all, you realize that what you're really doing is uh, you're, God, I hate when you do this to me. I, it's, it's, you're solving problems, you know, yeah. you meet people. And for the most part, you know, most of the time, everybody's okay. They want to sell their property, whatever. But you run across situations like this, and then they, you know, <clears throat> they kind of, you have to make decisions because you become a representative for the seller. Okay. That, that's what ends up happening. You know, who you're, if you think you're going to stay in this business any length of time and be greedy uh, and, you know, go walk in and take advantage of somebody like this, you know, to begin with, you got problems, but you, you end up having to sit there and go, okay. <sighs> I got to do what's in the best interest of this guy, right? So I go back. I make a point to go back to him. I sit with him and I say, look, <clears throat> you should try to clean this place up and list it with a broker. And you're going to get a, you know, you'll get more money than I'm going to be able to give you because I got to, you know, I got to fix this up and I got to make a profit at the end and stuff like that. He said, no, I don't, I don't want that. That's when he kind of explains all the stuff about <clears throat> why, you know, it, it's not. But we go on. I say to him that day, I said, you know, the thing is this. You know, all the story you've told me, everything that's happened, your time here isn't done yet. You know, we're going to make this happen and we're going to, we're going to, we're going to work this out. And, and I went through, I want you to know, I got, the more I, I went to visit him more and more, he stopped going downtown to LA market and doing what he was doing, <clears throat> cleaned them up, shaved them up, got them shaved. Uh, clean, yeah, we, we, and we even cleaned up his house. I want you to know, I hired people to go into his house and clean up his house and get it to where he could actually you shower. You know? And you bought it. You bought him clothes. I bought him a Hawaiian shirt, like what you're wearing, one of those tiki shirts. <laughs> I bought him. Yeah, I bought him a Hawaiian shirt, a bright one. It was red. It was in the reddish and yellowish color. It was, you know, beautiful. This guy became a human being again, you know, and uh, and he would say to me, and listen to this when we go, because I in the conversations, I said, what's with the clover lawn, dude? The rest of your place. Is a <laughs> he goes, oh, no, 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 no. He says, I, that's what I love. He says, as a matter of fact. When I sell you this house, you got to put it in the deed. And he was aware, he was smart. I mean, he was on the escrow company. He right. knew 
He said, I want it in the deed. I get to come over here and, and we take care of that Culver lawn. If not, I'm not selling you this house. <laughs> that went into the deed and it went into the deed when I resold that house to a young couple. Wow. And he did that. He said, as long as he was in the area, he wanted to have the option to go. And they loved it. They thought it was, and he was a really, really sweet person. You know, um, he just had lost his, his, his way. And, yeah. Yeah. and the first house I bought up here in Oregon was exactly kind of, not exactly the same thing, but in the same, in the, in the same way, the same terms, somebody who was angry at life and <clears throat> very despondent. And we yeah. ended up at the deal. I told that story today at lunch, by the way, just so you know. Oh, did you? Did you? <laughs> yeah. And I, I think it's so important. Like, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted you to teach was yeah. because who you, of who you were, not because of what you knew. Right. To me, that right. was really important because, yeah, in the middle of this trying to make all this money, you took, you took a moment and said, okay, this guy is not going to end this way and I can participate in helping him go somewhere, you know, and, and since I've had some similar conversations like that, where you go, okay, forget the house. How are you? You know, that type of thing. Yeah. So that's just, that's important. We're, we don't have a ton more time. Joey, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah I just had a quick question. Um, Cause um, you know, the, First of all, I think you guys have another radio show to do. It's called uh, St Real Estate Story Time with Theo Tony. You know? <laughs> yeah, I would love I, that. I think it would be great. No, but, uh, you know, the whole time that I was thinking, you know, here I have two, you know, Bruce and Tony, and you guys have been through, you know, a lot in real estate. Um, the question that kept coming to my mind is all those people, you know, Bruce, we sit in those one-on-ones where everybody's like, Hey, I listened to you and oh my God, my family's changed. But the landscape had to have been littered with people who didn't and got hurt. And how was that? Like, I want to hear from you guys. Like, how was that? Like having to hear from investors, like, man, I lost it all. Or what can I do to get back on my feet? You know, like, how, did you guys run into that a lot? You know, as oh. you guys, you know, oh, uh, went I'm sure through that? Tony, yeah. Well, I remember Mike, Mike Hantu um, and I would have lunch, Tony and I would have lunch. And yeah, the whole the whole world that got the timing wrong in that particular area of years, if you didn't exit by 2006 or seven, you got crushed. And there were so many people that lost everything. And it was a very different outcome. I mean, Tony sold everything. I sold uh, almost everything. <clears throat> Mike Cantu sold nothing, but he, he was ready for that. But yeah. the people that weren't ready for it and didn't sell got wiped out. So yo, those conversations were were plentiful and it's one of the things that you know that's why i value timing so important because tony bought the same house two years later yep. for almost yep. a tenth of the price what <clears throat> yep. it's unreal yeah and if you tell that to people honestly you know there's two experiences there's our personal experience you know the the, the things we live through but then when you try to share that with someone it, it doesn't it, it doesn't resonate sometimes you know they, they they it doesn't it doesn't land as solidly as when you live through it yourself obviously right so <clears throat> i mean i tell people these stories and i've said them over over the years the things that we've talked about these specific things that were so pivotal to to my changes in the way i did the business you know um up until the moment that i met that gentleman that we're uh, talking about I really didn't look at owner sellers like that. I just, I just, you know, I had a completely different mindset about it. Um, when I dealt with brokers and stuff, I went into those situations with uh, ideas about what I thought was important to them or this to that. I never thought about, oh, these guys are families or what the reason that they get up every morning and come to work. I'm thinking they're they're they're, they're, they're commission or this or that. And 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 and, and there are a lot of people that, that that's the motivating factor, right? That it's is it, their commission, but. Um, <clears throat> and there were a lot of people that got hurt. There were, I mean, I've heard those stories. I've spent hours in parking lots after speaking at some real estate club from somebody who comes up and he doesn't want to say it out loud in front of everybody else, uh, men and women, both, that would come up and say, you know, I didn't do so well in that last downturn or whatever. I lost everything. And now I got to, I got to, I got to do double to get it all back again, you know, and then, you, and then I try to 
speak to them and let them know that's not a good that's not a good way of going into this now you know coming back thinking you got to double up you know exactly no I, i've had the same thing you know where somebody said you know what i just lost a million dollars i have to find a way how to make a million dollars in the next 60 days it's like oh right. that's pretty much a good formula to make sure you lose that whatever else you have yeah it's Joey, just there, there's a big difference too in buying reos that damage is already done the bank owns the property right and so that's a different playing field. That's a professional company deciding it's in their best interest to sell you this house at 35 grand that they were owed a 300. That's, that's the way it goes. But when yeah. you're dealing with people, <clears throat> that's a different story. And it, you know, I don't know. I think the great majority of what Tony bought is definitely through brokers and REOs because that's the yeah. timing of it. I'd rather build in a boom market than try to buy it directly from a homeowner. But having the heart to look across the table and look at their situation. And part of it is just to make them realize this is not the end for you. Some people, yeah. you know, when they sell your home, they think, okay, I'm never going to own a home again. That's not true. Yeah. That's a doable thing. Okay. So I think that's important to have in your, in your repertoire. In other words, in your character, look across the table and see, because you know, there are a couple of stories that I have where, I mean, my first door knock of a foreclosure, you know, was answered by a, like an 80 year old woman. And I said, here, I'm here to talk to you about your loan situation. She said, oh, you know, I, we knew you would come eventually. And when I got inside, I realized she thought I was the lender. Mm. And then she owes like 11 grand on a 50 grand home. And she says, I'll just deed you the house. We just don't want any wood put on her windows. Well, I'm just going, okay, well, I can't buy this house. <laughs> I now put my grandson hat on and go, okay, you have any kids, you know? So I, I didn't want to buy that house. That wasn't the goal anymore. The goal was, please don't be homeless uh, because I understand what I'm doing and you don't. That just was unforgivable. And I couldn't have explained that money. You know, I can't go home and say, Koi, we get to make like 80% uh, on this house because, you know, that wouldn't be a good statement. <laughs> well, no, and, and we all have had those experiences. And I've over the years, I've heard from people that, look at it as a windfall, you know, oh, this is I, and they brag about it, you know, um, but we all make those decisions. And here's, here's my take on this. And because you, in the end, I can honestly tell you, I could probably dissect whatever level of success I've accomplished over the years, or that has been bestowed upon me, quite frankly, is the way, is the way that I think I really truly see it. Because only I know, maybe you do too, how stupid Tony Alvarez really is, okay? <laughs> I don't think Tony Alvarez is a genius by any stretch of the imagination. The only thing I have learned over the years is that it was better for me to be honest with myself and honest with other people about what I could or couldn't do, what I was willing to do, and what I was willing not to do. That seemed to be the safer bet for me overall as to achieving any kind of success or becoming uh, successful at anything I, that I really wanted to, that I could respect. Yeah, you know? that, that's the word that you could look in the mirror and say, I still like Tony Alvarez. Well, hell yeah. I mean, why, why would I, you know, I could rob purses, you know, I could rob banks. I could, and, 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 and I'm saying you could, you could take it, you could spend your life making your money as a result of taking advantage of somebody else or, or doing something that you just can't tell your son or your grandson about. Um, but I mean, what's the point? We're not, nobody's going to live forever here. Right. And we're all going out at some point. You never know when that's going to happen. So without going too far down that road, I made a set of rules for myself as to what I would do and what I wouldn't do. And I followed those, those rules. And overall, I think, I think you, we get crowned it's somehow, and I don't, I don't, I really don't understand it. I can't explain it clearly myself, but I think we, we, we get paid for what we do in every sense of the word. Right. So I think over time, if I, if anybody can say, Tony, well, you, you how did you accomplish this, this success? Because I got to learn to have some self-respect and to respect other people and care about their successes as much as my own. I cannot put it any different than that. Any better, any different. I well, got to learn. I, I want to, I, I want to bring up something because I know Tony, you made a tape one time, and I yeah. think it was it was in in response to he was speaking, as I recall, and there oh, was yeah. someone in the audience that was really negative about the ability to buy something below market. 
Yes. And so, so, so Tony thought, you know what? I'm going to go back and see if after the fact, how the sellers feel. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. It was a beautiful woman who sat in the front row and said to me, in the middle of my presentation says, because I had showed a couple of deals. One of them I had made $80,000 and the other one 75 grand or something. And she said, what, the first deal I explained, she goes, whoa, you really ripped those people. And then I sit and then that got my attention. I didn't say anything the first time. And she repeated it again to the tune. You really took advantage of them or you really stole something like that. You really ripped them off or something. But she was proud of it. She was like, she was like, like, whoa, you did a great thing. And I, I stopped in the middle of my presentation and, and I looked at her and I said, you know, I don't really know you, but because she really got my dander up. Okay. And I was trying to control myself, but <laughs> I, said, I said, it's obvious to me that you really have a difficult time in this business. You're not, you can't be very successful because if you think this business is about going around ripping people off, you, 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 your life in this business is going to be very short lived. And I turn around and she went silent. I turn around and I'm sure Nick Manfredi wanted to kill me because it was at his <laughs> meeting. But, but uh, you know, yeah, but, <clears throat> and, and that was, and that was the thing I did. I came out of that, that night, I drove home and I was so upset. I thought, wow, I did a terrible job. If that's what people perceive that I did, I got to change it up. I got to go figure out a way. And I went home. Remember I told you the first guy who ever went with me to, to listen to you speak was an Argentine guy. Yeah. Okay. He worked at a Spanish TV station. He did filming and recording. He's the guy who held his camera from his company with the microphones and everything that went with me. I was sitting with him and I was complaining to him. We would have lunch a lot. I said, Luis, I don't know how the heck I'm going to, how do I, these people think I'm a crook. I said, how the heck did I convey that? He goes, don't worry. I got it. He was like a big bear, big black beard, <laughs> long black hair. He goes, I tell you, no problem. I get camera. I follow you. Perfect. We want to do this. And he and we got that's how the idea came about. He gave me the idea to to, to, uh, to do that. And I said, oh, my God, I can do that. I can hold a microphone and I can go and ask him. I said, it's going to be a gamble. He goes, yes, we know. No, we don't know what they're going to say. Yeah, it was completely live. Right, right. And, yeah. no, and, and did you see some of those people? I mean, some of them were like you mentioned. You said one time yeah. the lady when she opened the door, she was having lunch and she's picking food out of her mouth and stuff. Right. <laughs> Yeah. And, and, uh, and that was a lesson for me because I, it really solidified it for me, the truth of what I had, of what I was doing that. No, uh, one of the guys I bought, I went on to buy several houses from him. He was a retired broker and I had brought him fruit. So he looks at the camera and he goes, well, I sold him the houses because you know, you brought me a basket of fruit and stuff and the pizza. <laughs> I said, tell him the truth. <laughs> you know, I yelled at him and I said, tell him the truth. He went on to sell me 10 houses and, the, and he was the first guy who ever said to me, he says, Hey, I'm going to sell you this house, but I need you to tell me you to, to do one thing for me. you got to promise me. I said, what? He goes, this tenant made me crazy. You, you got to come pick me up the day you take him out of that house. You got to come pick me up and let me watch the eviction. from across. <laughs> and that's, and that's, and that's exactly what I did. I picked him up. <laughs> over the, yeah. And he got to watch it. Not to, not to hijack uh, the, the end of the interview, but um, you know, when I get, you know, I get to talk to a lot of the investors, you know, because of my position here. And the, the one thing that they always ask me is, what does Bruce think about the market and what's he doing now? So I don't know how much you, you, you've thought about what's going on in the market, but I, I know the, the audience would love to hear what you're doing right now. Okay. Tony. All right. No, no, I can do that. I can do that. Sure. So certainly. Well, first of all, um, you know, when I've, I've ended up here in Oregon to where I'm doing, um, I went into new construction, but again, it was a result of uh, Bruce's influence to a certain extent, uh, to a great extent, because I was at uh, one of the club meeting, one well, not a club meeting, one of his presentations on timing, I think it was, down in California uh, a while back, and uh, he said he was talking about uh, uh, positive uh, net migration, and he said there's uh, two uh, two states in the union right now that are having a positive net migration. This was a while ago. And he said, one of them, a number one is Florida. Number two is, and he stopped and he goes, is Tony here? And it was about, I don't know, three, 400 people, whatever the heck it was in that, in that room. And I was there and Sabrina goes, he just mentioned you, you idiot. I wasn't, you know, paying attention. I was talking. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I said, what? I'm here. And then he said, are you in Oregon still? I said, yeah. He says, well, you're number two. He said, those are the only two states with positive net migration. Okay, that changed everything. 
the minute that you said that, I came back to Oregon, which I had been coming up here for years, as a, and this was my getaway from real estate, never had bought anything up here except the house for myself. And I reanalyzed the market from an investor standpoint for the very first time in many years and started buying stuff up here. But then I went and visited Bruce in Florida. I saw what he was doing with new construction. And I was having difficulty finding inventory up here. So I, I started stuff that I wanted to buy. Most of it was junky and old. And uh, I started looking at tearing down some of those things and dividing split. I had never split lots. I had never done any of that stuff. And then uh, I, I had built a couple of houses. I didn't build anything. I had some contract to do it for me in Cal you know, in Lancaster, uh, which I did very well at. Um, I think they cost me 165 each and we sold them at the peak of the market for like 400 some odd thousand. But up here, I got into, into building. Uh, I zeroed in and studied the market. And instead of building 60 uh, a single family houses, I started building duplexes. And we've done three different developments, one of which we're finishing. I always post uh, some of these things on Facebook. I just posted this past week. Um, the, and we've graduated, you know, changing, kind of always improving on what we're building. There are small developments. The first one was nine lot subdivision, uh, eight duplexes and a triplex, all one story, all catered to the over 50s crowd. Um, the second one was uh, 11 lots. Um, and these are things I paid. I paid $200,000 for an old teardown and split it into 11 lots. And, uh, it, you know, it cost me maybe 280, 290 for that duplex to be built. I just got an appraisal, came in at 515,000 and they're low. Um, but, you know, so I built that. And then as, as we were leasing out stuff, people are telling us, you know, hey, we'd like smaller units. And we get a lot of interest from the nursing community, you know, nurses and doctors and stuff temporary contracts, all this. So this last development is only 12 little um, um, 600 square foot, one bedroom, one bath things that I thought, this is an error, this is an error in my judgment. I'm gonna regret this. Well, those things are renting for $1,200. They're not even built yet, okay? We already have a waiting list from the hospital, which is down the, probably a couple of miles down the road from us. And, uh, I was going to make it a seniors over 50 crowd. And <clears throat> I think we're probably going to go 100% leased out to the hospital because they have nurses and doctors that all want to be close by, uh, whether they're short term contracts or whether they're moving into the area eventually to buy a house. But you can't find anything. You can't, you know, right now the market's so tight. So they're, they're you know, I got, I got a two a husband and wife nurse both of them nurses, renting a 600 square foot unit from us right now. Actually, it's 580 square feet, one bedroom, one bath. She makes $35,000 a month. A month. Okay. So qualifying them was no problem. <laughs> yeah, the, I can say. The, the regular rent on that, on that unit would be uh, $1,100 to $1,200, right? It's not a brand new one that we built. It's an old one that we rehabbed. $1,100 to $1,200. We're getting twenty five hundred dollars a month, and, and and they're more than happy to pay it, you know. And uh, yeah, and she's uh, there, she's in there for a six month lease or something. And no sooner is she out, she brings she they actually refer us. They actually bring somebody in who they know is coming in to take their position or whatever, and they need a place. And uh, and that's uh, so that's what that's what we've been doing. I haven't been doing a lot of rehabbing of older properties and stuff like that. I did this time when I liquidated in California. We sold single families in the threes. For every single family I was selling in California, I was up here in Oregon buying either a duplex or a fourplex. I was buying fourplexes for three hundred and something thousand dollars when Bruce woke me up. What that now today we're selling? We have an escrow for seven hundred and ninety-five thousand bucks. Three twenty-five, seven ninety-five. Okay. Now, and, now you're and, you're involved in Florida is. Oh, yeah. Is, is yeah. Don't summer. forget Florida. If I had it my way, to be very honest with you, I'd have 100 percent of my inventory in Florida, because when you look at when you study the market, there's no other market that I would that I would want to be in. So I think we're, we're at 20 some odd places down there. And and uh, <laughs> I talked to Bruce not too long ago because I said I got all this money coming back from these refinances that I, that I, uh, I, I triggered. I got some four percent interest that I locked into some of my uh, existing properties. And I said, I got to have this ton of cash. I just did a new, I don't, you know, sometimes I can help talk numbers. You know, some people don't talk numbers, but um, 
I, I sat down with her. Sabrina said, you got to find someplace to put this money. I said, well, how much money is it? Because I'm, I'm so stupid. So I, I, I trigger these things and I do it on paper and then I forget about it. She goes, Tony, you're going to be at $8 million in cash in the bank. What are you going to do with this? I thought it was like 3.5, <laughs> you know, 2.7. You know, I'm using these numbers to calculate. Remember the conversation I had with you? I yeah. said, I want a couple million dollars. I said, like, that's wrong. This got to be wrong. She says, no, you're getting four just from this refinance that you're doing. And you already have a bunch in the, in the, in the bank. Of course, I'm earning nothing on it. So I feel kind of stupid. But the only place that, that really that I feel comfortable is uh, looking towards the future, to be very honest with you, this market here, I'm estimating is going to take a hit. And it's, 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 it may not be severe, you know, it depends on how things go, but I'm okay because I built, the only things I'm going to be holding in Oregon are things that I built and they're one story, I have great tenants, they're either over 50 crowd, like I said, they're lovely people or they're, they're the, the medical community. I feel very confident and comfortable with those tenants. Even if the prices go down, you know, uh, I'm all, we're in a good position. And you're looking and, looking in the next year or so to, to be a resident of Florida? That's my goal. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and you can't beat it because in, if you want to, if you're going to pick a state to die in, you don't want it to be Oregon. OK, the estate taxes here are the worst in the country, I think. I, I, I hate to say it, but so Florida, I'm telling you what, <laughs> not only is it the best state to be in overall, is, that's my opinion. Um, but I also got Cuban food all around me, which I shouldn't be eating a lot of. But, you know, I, I, can't, <laughs> I can't forget that. So I am looking forward to that. Yes. OK. All right, buddy. Yeah, we've we've gone over time, but it was cool. Enjoy talking to you again. Very it's much. my pleasure, Bruce. Anytime, anytime at all. I, I love to do it. And if you want to structure anything else and just talk about stories, I would, I mean, I would love that because I think even in today's world where the whole real estate thing is everybody's online and this and that and the other thing, you know, there's still a tremendous amount of, of deals that we do locally. You know, I mean, I said, okay, I'm not going to build anything else. I'm not doing anything else in Oregon, right? I'm not, I did it. I'm, I did what I came to do and that, that's it. No sooner did I say that, a real estate agent in the area calls me. She personally has a subdivision that she got approved in all this. Unfortunately, during her, it was her whole family's money in, involved in it. She's the leader of the band, so to speak. She's got like 50 some odd fourplexes or something. I don't know, 50 some odd. No, I, I, it's 50 some odd units total, but it's all fourplexes. <clears throat> and she says her mom, in the middle of it all, her mom passes away unexpectedly. Now they're not so happy about the, about the thing. They, they want to get rid of it. So she came to me, she goes, you know, I, I heard that you're doing stuff in town and stuff. Would you, would you be interested? Now I, you know, do I really want to do this? You know, I mean, but I made the mistake of speaking to Brad, my, 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 my best, one of my best friends, and he's was in the gold gym business for right. years. So yeah. he, he sold this company for, I don't know, over $80 million. And he's, he's sitting there doing nothing. And I mentioned it to him just in passing. And yesterday, that was like a month ago, yesterday he calls me and says, so where's that deal we're going to do? <laughs> I, said, I didn't say we're going to do the deal. He goes, Tony, why, we got the money. Why not do the deal? You know, and you know the market. So I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll venture into another development thing. I don't know. It all depends on timing, right? I'll call and ask you first. You know, uh, Bruce, you know, one yeah. of the things I've been lucky to uh, – to uh, experience, you know, being a part of the Norris group is, you know, meeting a lot of, you know, special people, you know, in real mm -hmm. estate. And I, and I have to say that um, the overriding, the most successful people in real estate, um, they, they give, you know, w without asking. Uh, and there's a, there's an abundance mentality to the most, you know, there's, you know, if you're willing to work hard in real estate, there's enough for everybody, you know, I get that from you. I get that from the most successful real estate investors that I get to meet, you know, because of this. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that, that comes across in, 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 in the most, um, you know, honest and, and, uh, and experienced people that, that we get to come across. My remember, yeah. remember Tony Alvarez, Tony, you've met him, my friend, the Cuban. Oh, yeah. Guy. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I teach him first and then I start saying, okay, I'm going to teach classes. He's like, what? 
you're going to teach everybody else this? <laughs> I said, yeah, it's not going to affect how much we do. <laughs> Tony, I know you're coming next uh, boot camp. It's going to be at the end of August, so we'll have to go get some Cuban food together. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. That's my favorite thing. I have buddies that go down to Florida and visit. In the in the you know the first thing they do is take a picture of some Cuban sandwich they have at the airport you know and send it to me just so I can get jealous right so, yeah I'm looking all right. forward all right Tony have yourself a good night great talking thank to you thank you very much thank you both thank you thank okay we'll see you. For more information on hard money loans and upcoming events with the Norris Group, check out thenorrisgroup.com. For information on passive investing with trust deeds, visit tngtrustdeeds.com. The Norris Group originates and services loans in California and Florida under California DRE License 01219911, Florida Mortgage Lender License 1577, and NMLS License 1623669. For more information on hard money lending, go to thenorrisgroup.com and click the hard money tab.